Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Painless Universal Conversation with myself and Raj. Today's conversation, after prison to helping others. To helping others realize the mistake they've made and how they could change their path. My guest, Kurt Myers, will be telling us his own story. Before we start, let me tell you a little bit about him. After prison, helping others move forward. Prison gave Kurt Myers a perspective he uses in professional life. He realized quickly that he's probably the most well-versed person in the room when talking about what prison is like. What led him on that path was an accidental shooting which cost his friend his life. And Kurt Myers was just 17. Despite the the tragic incident, and the lengthy incarnation that followed, an education journey began from the inside of prison. Ultimately, this has led him to the University of Washington, Tacoma, with McGrath School of Business, where he is learning to help others who has been incarnated when they come out learn the skills that will make them useful to society again. This conversation is very touchy because it's one that has led to someone spending numerous years in prison. But it's also it's a very insightful conversation because you will learn that whatever you go through, whatever pain that's happened to you in your life, there's always ways to heal and find your joy at the end of it. Meet my amazing guest, who's taking the time out of this busy schedule to talk to us, Kat Myers. Well, hello everyone again. Welcome to Painless Universal Conversation with myself, Anne Welsh. As I said in my introduction, today's story is one that will truly inspire you. It will get you to think about your life and also no matter what happens to you, no matter what challenges you've been through, there's always hope at the end of the tunnel. My guest, Kurt, will be telling us about his journey after prison and helping others to see their own own fates, see their own journey and believe that it can be done, that life does not end when you've been when you've been to prison, that you could still do good from your bad. Meet my guest, Kurt. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you so much. Uh, grateful to be here today for sure. So I'm really grateful to have you. I mean, you're, um, I read about your thing at the University of Washington Post that you did something online. And I thought to myself, wow, what an amazing story that people, most people who go through those tragic circumstances in their life don't never go back or never say they'll go back to university because they think that defines them. And not realizing that life, there's so many moments, so many stones that defines us in life. It is not just one moment that defines us. But Kurt, before we get started into all yeah. of this, who are you? Oh, um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, really, honestly, uh, I am a, a individual who has, um, you know, um, a real a will to want to uh, help others overcome whatever it is suffering that they're uh, experiencing in life, um, having been through quite a bit myself. Um, I feel that you know, I came into this world, uh, you know, sort of a, like a creative young, young man, um, uh, probably a little too adventurous, uh, and for my own good. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, with that creativity, you know, I have been able to recreate myself, you know, uh, I have, uh, you know, having been through the experiences that, that have defined me and made me who I am, and, um, you know, sort of propelled me, uh, you know, towards, uh, you know, like achieving uh, uh, goals and, and dreams in my life. Uh, I want to share that with others. Um, I, I believe we all have that capacity. And there's a lot of narratives out there that can, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, convince us that that isn't the case. Uh, but I, I hope to be somebody who has a story uh, that can re, you know, um, that can change that narrative and can uh, sort of awaken folks to their own potential as well. 
Oh, that's really good. I love that very brief, nice answer about who you are. And it's just, you know, when you talk about it, you talk very candidly about from your own experience and helping others to learn that they could find that, that joy again. When you look at your background growing up, growing up what was it truly like? Yeah, so um, it was it was very, um, you know, I, I came up uh, in Tacoma, Washington, um, sort of in a, you know, lower middle class neighborhood. I, I had both parents present in my life, um, though they were, um, you know, uh, both scraping to make ends meet and to, um, you know, put food, food on the table and pay rent and things like that. So, um, it, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I had a lot of potential um, to, um, you know, I, I was a very creative young man. I was always in theater, uh, performing arts and things like that. Um, that was really sort of um, what I what I enjoyed doing. I liked you know, entertaining folks, making them laugh. Uh, uh, before we got on this show, uh, we were t uh, you and I were discussing um, our children and how, uh, you know, um, your child is a little bit, fr uh, you know, shy of the camera. Uh, my son is definitely a chip off the old block. He's jumping in front of this camera whenever he gets a chance. And I think I was very similar, you know, um, when I was young. And so um, when I when I reached my teen years, I feel like um, I really started to lose touch with that part of myself. Um, I didn't really uh, have anybody to sort of uh, guide that potential um, because, you know, my parents were just really busy trying to get by. Um, and so, uh, I, I started running, you know, the streets. I was, I was, you know, I had like this thrill seeking, sensation seeking, adventure seeking sort of spirit that, uh, if not, if not directed in the right, on the right course, uh, it had the potential to, you know, um, find less productive things to do. And that's what I did. You know, I was, um, you know, sort of a, a like a runaway. Um, my parents, uh, well, one of the questions that comes up when you're, when you're experiencing uh, incarceration is like, and I also worked for an organization called the IF Project, which poses this question to folks. Um, so that they can start to unpack their past and maybe recreate their future. It's, uh, you yeah. know, is there something that somebody could have said or done to to change the path that led you to prison? And for me, I always thought like I just needed somebody to absolutely hold my hand. You know, I was just one of those spirits that uh, if you 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 know, if you wasn't guided and and um, you know watched over. Um, with with real with real scrutiny that he would end up um, finding his way into some mischief and so that's what I did and um, I was in and out of juvenile institutions um, mm -hmm. for um, taking motor vehicles and trying to joyride cars and um, all of that and uh, and so yeah I was I was really misled youth uh, who um, you know just just really wanted freedom but didn't realize that everything that he was doing was probably going to lead him, uh, you know, further and further away from freedom. So it's just, um, yeah, that's kind of uh, yeah. the gist of my childhood and how I came up. No, absolutely, because it's, um, I think it's what we find with lots of teenagers, um, they get to that age, um, parents these days, especially past with the pandemic, both parents have to work so hard. It's very rare to see where, a parent could stay at home because even if you have both parents, they're all working or they're incredibly busy in their own little world. Forgetting that there's a child out there that actually is crying, could you just hold my hand or could you just guide me through this process? Because when, when you neglect that process, that turns into a massive disaster for the whole family at large. When you look at your bit, you were only 17 at the time of the tragedy. Um, did you see any hope in yourself when this tragedy happened? I had, um, I was, uh, I was also a teen that, you know, uh, engaged in a lot of you know, like drugs and alcohol use kind of folds into my sensation seeking and thrill seeking. And so um, right before the tragedy had occurred, I had gone to treatment and um, had really been doing well uh, with my um, abstaining from, from, uh, drug and alcohol use after treatment. 
Um, however, you know, the night of the incident, I did um, decide to uh, drink again, which was um, a very, um, you know, pro proved to be a very, uh, you know, s a bad, bad mistake on my behalf. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, I was definitely hopeful. I was 17 years old. I had um, getting out of treatment, I started earning some, some of my uh, parents, um, you know, trust back, um, was starting to go to school again. Um, I had plans to uh, enroll at an occupational skills center uh, here in, in Washington uh, State and Western Washington area, where I was going to learn web design, which would have been in 2000, in the year 2000, probably a pretty good direction to take, seeing as, you know, the internet ended up blowing up and all of that. But, um, you know, uh, as, li as life would have it, uh, that wasn't my, uh, you know, the, the way that things would turn out for me, so. Yeah, and what was it that sparked your you know, when you, when this tragedy happened, were you, can you remember how you were feeling when you have an argument? Can you remember any of those feelings that will happen to you when these tragedies will have happened? No, it was, uh, it was not um, a contentious, uh, you know, situation at all. In fact, it was really just a moment of uh, just utter blunder, not really thinking uh, clearly, um, you know, due to the fact that I was inebriated and, and really just, um, you know, just playing, playing around, um, real tragic mistake that, uh, yeah, at the time I, I really wasn't looking at it, um, with the, uh, level of seriousness that, um, I should have been, uh, playing with guns, um, and, and young and, and inebriated. So, yeah. For those who don't know, it was an accident where he accidentally shot his his friend. That I mean, that cost his friend his life, and he Kurt had to go to prison for this. Could you describe your journey of when you knew that now your life was totally changed because you'd be spending some time in prison? Yeah, um, you know, uh, after the incident had occurred, I you know. Um, you know, I, I obviously felt I, it was a very, it was a very uh, overwhelming set of circumstances that I was really just uh, beside myself um, with grief and guilt and, uh, and, and really just, um, you know, just feeling hopeless. So, I mean, going into it, I felt like I was probably never going to get out of prison, you know, because I didn't know anything about uh, the legal, the, 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 you know, thing about the juvenile system is that you're very much in and out of it. Um, there's really no serious, like uh, comparatively serious consequences uh, for a lot of the uh, crimes that you commit um, versus if you committed those crimes as an adult, there would be a much harsher sentence associated with um, the, the same the same act. And so I had been, uh, you know, sort of disillusioned by uh, that, that being able to just go in and out. Um, and I, and I knew it, you know, I, I knew that what I had done was a, uh, was a serious, uh, situation. Um, and that, uh, I, you know, I figured at that point I would, I would never get out of prison. Um, and so it, you know, was, uh, it was very difficult. You know, I, um, turned myself in, my father drove me to the police station, um, as soon as I got into uh, custody um, and was uh, taken to juvenile, I was I was told that I would be tried as an adult. And uh, after I was declined on in the juvenile system, they sent me to the adult uh, jail in Seattle, in downtown Seattle. Um, and so, yeah, at 17 years old, um, I was just just really. Um, in a dark place, you know, just completely overwhelmed with guilt, guilt and shame and uh, just pain, yeah. you know, um, and then having to then uh, learn, figure out how I was going to navigate the adult system um, and uh, sort of 
dealing with all that that entails, which is um, a whole nother set of uh, issues and problems to have to <laughs> navigate. So that is so incredibly journey. I mean, it's, I mean, it must be so painful for you because I mean, this was something that happened out of an accident because of also also because of your, you know, your your teenage impulse as well because you know when you're a teenager you want to do this what message would you give to young teenagers today after seeing what you've been through yeah um you know i i i think that one of the messages that i give to teens because i'm often um you know engaged in programs and services that that uh, uh where i speak to kids and uh and teens and troubled teens that are going through similar circumstances and i think that one of the things that uh, the, you know teens tend to think about their lives is that um, that they're going to live forever. Kind of, you have that sort of uh, inv invincibility factor um, that's really uh, you know it can be a major roadblock <laughs> for folks. Um, but then also um, the idea that you know once you've made a mistake, you're not you know, all isn't lost. I think that I had, had, as a juvenile, been in and out of prison, or excuse me, a juvenile institution. And um, because I had a felony on my record, people had always told me, you know, you it's on your permanent record, you know, you're, uh, you're basically going to have a tough go at the rest of your life. And to hear that at age 15, 16 years old, you're basically looking at life like you're at a, a serious disadvantage, a deficit that you won't be able to come back from because it's permanent. Um, and even if there is means of expunging your record or whatever, it's so many years down the line and that's forever to a young mind that, that you know, and so it's so easy to fall into that trap that basically you're a throwaway already and that you don't, there's no way out of it. Um, and so I try to, you know, impress upon young minds that your life is just beginning. Uh, there is, uh, you know, endless opportunity out there for you. And where there are barriers, you have the ability to break through those barriers. You know, um, uh, people are doing it all the time. Uh, in Washington State, we have, you know, many examples of formerly incarcerated success stories that we try to highlight, that we try to cite when we're talking to young folks. Um, we have one of the first uh, uh, formerly incarcerated state representatives, mm -hmm. uh, Tara Simmons. Um, we have, uh, you know, formerly incarcerated uh, doctors, lawyers, um, well, people that have doctorate degrees, lawyers, uh, professors, all all kinds of um, you know, game changers, people that came along and uh, were told that they couldn't do something and uh, decided to push back and say, no, I can do this. And in fact, you might really need me in the, in the fight, uh, you know, to sort of uh, fix these problems, these social ail ailments that we suffer from in our communities. And I think that that narrative is starting to take hold um and so yeah i that that for young folks i i just want them to know that their life is just beginning and that they may have made mistakes up to this point but um you know given their you know the right mindset and uh you know connecting yourself with folks that um can help you you can get past anything and and in fact end up uh, achieving uh dreams beyond your your imagination and so yeah that is true and it's so it's so it's so possible which is sometimes we we think um because of the way the world is being programmed when you're this age you should be this when you're that age you should be married or this you should graduate but sometimes the world is not really designed this way everyone's every time's time to shine is absolutely different and not because someone has labeled you something doesn't mean you can't change and become a better person and become useful to society you started your education journey in prison. Can you tell me about your education? What, what, what was it that you were doing? Sure. So um, I would say the first five years of my incarceration, I was really, my education was really just based on um, just uh, basic activities that I was able to do 
um, that sparked my interest while, um, you know, trying to just bide my time. So um, I, I would say I was a bit um, educationally underdeveloped. Uh, I had been doing a lot of skipping school and getting sent to juvenile and not really, you know, paying too much attention academically. And so um, I had been uh, a bit stunted. I think my GED scores were like, um, you know, ranked in the, like the 50, 50 percentile, 49th percentile. Mm -hmm. And so I barely got my GED um, while I was in county jail. And so when I got sent to prison, you know, I, my education was really uh, self-taught. You know, I was writing letters to a lot of uh, my family members and friends and people. So, um, you know, I experimented with creative writing and um, different ways to sort of just express myself on paper. Um, I, I also, uh, I write music, you know, so I, I, I did a lot of like developing myself musically and creatively and, um, and all of that. Um, but really, it was, and it did a lot of reading as well, you know, obviously, you got to uh, pass time and in, in prison, however you can. And so I did, I read a lot of books, which really did help me in my, um, you know, personal development, educational development, um, thinking outside the box, learning new ideas, um, and concepts that were intriguing to me, mm -hmm. and trying to mimic writing, uh, you know, of, of authors that I enjoyed reading, uh, and things like that. So it was really just at first sort of just getting caught up with, you know, where I probably should have been in high school, you know, just, just off of, uh, just activities like that, uh, just passing time. And then in 2005 at Walla Walla, uh, uh, Washington state penitentiary here in Walla Walla, uh, or in Washington state, um, it's a closed custody facility. So that means it's like, you know, kind of maximum security, you know, high, high, um, uh, security prison and uh, they started a couple programs uh, one being the HVAC program which is heating ventilation air conditioning and the other was a welding program and I was at a point then I was about 22 years old uh, 23 years old and my brain was really starting to thirst for knowledge you know um, they talk about the prefrontal cortex um, development in in human beings and how you know, uh, it's the decision-making center of our brain. And when that part of our brain is not developed, we tend to make decisions that are not favorable um, as far as outcomes are concerned. And so it's a tough go at, at teenage, the teenage years and, and the young adulthood navigating that, um, particularly when you have things like hormones raging, you have things like, you know, alcohol being in, introduced into the equation and all of that. And then to have, you know, that part of your brain not fully developed kind of makes for um, a recipe for disaster for a lot of young, young men, particularly, but everyone in general. Um, and so there is a lot of young, like young folks that end up in prison because of that, you know, um, but it was like a light bulb had switched on around that time. You know, I was like, I was just hungry uh, to learn and to grow and to become something. And um, so I joined the HVAC uh, program. I learned heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And it was something that I never thought that I would learn. Um, uh, it was, I had never uh, graduated anything in my life. And so that, you know, to, to complete that course was a real, um, just, uh, amazing experience for me in my own personal development. Um, and, you know, to, to just know that I was, you know, I had this skill that would be marketable and valuable to, um, the community once I got out to be able to fix somebody's fridge you know I never thought I would know all the inner workings of you know uh, you know central heating and air system in somebody's house or their refrigerator or whatever right so learning all this stuff not only gave me like a marketable skill uh, but it also gave me a sense of self-worth you know like I can I can learn stuff I'm not just a throwaway you know I uh, I'm capable of things greater than, than I had it ever imagined. And so um, after that, it really did spark a need for achievement in me that really just, you know, blossomed from that point forward. 
I was like, you know, I want to learn more. And um, so luckily I had, um, my father had uh, invested in an education account for my sister. Um, and she, uh, because she just kind of went into motherhood um, at a, a fairly young age and continued to have children uh, until this day, uh, she's got five children. And so she never really had time to use that, uh, that college tuition. And so, um, you know, I sort of have asked my dad, like, hey, you know, uh, I want to learn more. I want to take college courses. And he said, you know, he's like, Kurt, uh, most kids your age want to go to college so that they can party and, and have a good time. And you're telling me you just want to learn. He was like, absolutely. And so, um, so, so yeah, I started taking college courses through course via correspondence with um, Ohio University. They have a, a college program for the incarcerated. Um, it would, they got a great curriculum. It was all paper-based. So I was doing things longhand in my cell, reading the textbooks, teaching myself for the most part, they had like learning guides and modules, but for the most part, if I sent an, uh, an assignment in, I'd have to wait two weeks to get the response back so that I could, you know, get the next thing. Correct, correct my thinking or whatever, and then move on to the next assignment. So it was a long journey just to get an associate's degree. But, um, you know, during that time, I'm learning things like psychology and uh, economics and uh, physics and, um, you know, liberal arts, uh, I, I, you know, math. Math was something that I always said, I'm not good at math. Um, but I wanted to get a science degree because I, you know, I'm more left brain than I am right brain. I'm just uh, kind of a di divergent thinker anyway. And so I knew it was kind of a hole in my knowledge base or my brain that I really needed to hone in on. And so um, I, I sat down and taught myself math all the way up to calculus. And these are things that I never thought I would, I would be able to do, let alone sort of like on my own. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was a very, it just really opened up my mind to critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, all of these things. And, uh, all, self by, uh -huh. and all by just when you were in prison, this is when you learned these whole new skills. Sure, yeah, I was, I was learning, you know, while I was learning about, you know, self-actualization, I was self-actualizing, you know, and like, all of these different areas. And so, you know, but at the same time, I also realized that I, you know, I'd be out in the day room working on an assignment and people would come up to me and say, man, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm working on an you know, assignment for this degree I'm trying to get. And they had expressed to me like, man, I wish I could do that, man, you know? And I, uh, it was then that I realized it's like, man, everybody needs this, you know, everybody in prison needs to be able to lock, unlock their potential. Mm -hmm. And so, that's why prison education for me is a big deal. It's something that I've championed. I've worked for organizations like the Prison Scholar Fund, uh, who fu um, they, they work to fund the education of folks who are incarcerated because they don't have access to, um, you know, tuition money or uh, and, and all of that. In recent years, they've passed bills that have reversed um, the bans that they had on um, access to uh, financial aid and and tuition funds uh, federally that um, that uh, they had they had put in place in the early 90s uh, that because before that you could access federal funds and and get an education while you were incarcerated and so luckily we won that it was a long battle um, to try to get that overturned but it was eventually overturned and so but yeah up up into this this point. Uh, it has been something that has not been accessible for folks that are incarcerated. And, um, and I, I, I just thought that that was a major fail on behalf of, um, you know, our correctional system, yeah. our carceral system, to not uh, have access to uh, these life-changing, mm -hmm. life, uh, trajectory-altering, <laughs> you know, educational resources and, and, and opportunities. So... Well, especially um, when they come out, they can utilize it. Because when you look at it now, would you have a mentor, someone guiding you in your work? Sure, I, I have quite a few. That was one thing. I mean, I I read a lot of self help books too. You know, um, <clears throat> like uh, yeah, one one of them was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That was kind of a a real 
uh, influential book in, that I read while I was incarcerated. And it, it, it talked about sort of getting mentors, gaining mentors. Um, basically, anybody who I'd come across or had, had uh, you know, saw potential in me and um, they had something that I wanted. You know, like I, I like the way that this person carries himself or, wow, I really uh, am inspired by this ability, this person's ability to speak well or, you know, whatever. And so I would kind of cling to those kind of folks, um, whether they be my fellow incarcerated uh, people in there or people that were on the streets that were sort of helping me gu guide me. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that I have quite a long list of mentors and I would always encourage folks to have the same because um, you know you are pretty much the circle of individuals that you keep and um, so if you make sure that that circle is is just full of inspirational beings that uh, you know have uh, you know skills talents and uh, you know connections and things like that that you don't have to definitely um, you know uh, get to know those people and to keep them close in your life because it's oftentimes that you'll find that they're willing to uh, take you on as a mentee and if they see that you're eager and that you have the potential they'll they'll help foster that. Absolutely um, you know when you had to go back into society after a couple of years what have been the most painful aspect of reintegrating into society after a long time in prison? that's a quite a long list as well <laughs> um so i i would say that uh there's there's many things that you you know i i like i said i had gotten two associate's degrees while i was incarcerated i got um a career diploma in bookkeeping i had the hvac certification so i getting when getting out of prison i thought that you know i had been pretty well equipped for this release right you know like uh i would be I would be, you know, um, capable. I had, I had uh, put enough tools in my tool belt to really uh, navigate well and to to not only, you know, survive the transition but thrive, you know. And, um, you know, if you want to make God laugh, then tell him your plans. <laughs> uh you know and i was just it's funny i just wrote a post about this today about expectations and how they um you know to have expectations oftentimes you'll be lead lead to disappointment um, but there's you know there's been a lot you know it's uh it, there's been you know uh, having to navigate um like initially just being just going into a grocery store can be overwhelming i mean there's so many selections of of different things, items that you can get for one particular use, right? Um, then, then you have things like you know navigating relationships, you know, family reintegration, um, sort of like what what the managing the expectations of what your family um, expects with your release and sort of how things unfold, um, and and being able to navigate that is difficult. Um, uh, things that you talked about with your family um, while you're incarcerated, uh, you know, might not, it might not be exactly like that, right? Uh, and then any expectations that you had of, say, like having relationships, um, you know, um, it's, it's not easy. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm a man who was incarcerated with nothing but men for, you know, the, some very formative years of his adult life. And so to get out, even, you know, um, getting to know women again, <laughs> it can be, uh, you know, a, a bumpy road. <laughs> and so, um, but, it, you know, ultimately it's, uh, it, it's been difficult in, in certain ways. And, 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 but ultimately it has been, um, you know, just an amazing journey uh, to be able to learn and to adapt and to grow and to make mistakes. Absolutely. and uh and to learn from them and to uh, be able to continue to recreate yourself i mean um i've learned a lot of lessons even in the last couple of years you know that i i feel have been um just uh, instrumental in making me a better person uh allowing me to show up uh to to things in a in a more authentic way um and to be able to be a better uh benefit to to everyone around me right and so um though there's challenges um i think that that's it's important that folks uh, find their support you know find your people um i've actually recently joined 
uh, a group of formerly incarcerated um, folks and we work on healing. We work on, we, we, we uh, meet every week and we talk about these things that we're dealing with. And um, it's very important to have a group of folks that can relate to your situation because it's real easy to feel like you're the only one dealing with these things out here in the world when it's that's not in fact the case there are so many people that are experiencing the exact same thing that you're struggling with um and just to be able to recognize that and say oh, okay good i'm not alone i mean it's um it's not like misery loves company but it's more like you know uh, we can work together to try to heal um and so that's what we're doing. And it's been a really amazing experience for me to be a part of that group. Um, but that's what I've found in this whole formerly incarcerated community is a whole lot of folks that are overcoming these obstacles that are, um, that are inspired, you know, mutually inspiring one another in our different respective roles that we play in this community. Um, and, and how we're working to make a, a an impact in the um, issues that are most uh, important to us in our own particular path. Absolutely. In a perfect world, right, when you, because you've now talked to so many people who've been through this process, how should one as a prison and be integrated into society so they could benefit society as well? What would be your perfect world scenario? Um, it's sort of like, uh, if, uh, you know, what, what kind of, uh, steps should somebody take if that if that's what they would they would like for their lives um i would say and i and i do do this i i feel like uh you know there's been several opportunities i've had to talk to folks that have just gotten out that are you know i mean there's a lot of initial uh you know things that one has to do that are really imperative you know you got to get your documentations together you know your license and all these things and then you got to um, find a job and then, you know, hopefully figure out how you're going to figure out and find a place to live and all of that. So, you know, those things are very critical. And one of the ways that you do that is you get involved in organizations that help folks yeah. with that, with navigating those issues. Um, and in doing that, also um, to stay connected with those individuals throughout your um your reentry journey, you know, it's not just like, oh, you're done with the program and, uh, you know, you're off to living your life, because as soon as you do that, you, you'll find yourself in situations where you need support. And if you've disconnected yourself with that, with that community, then it can really seem overwhelming and those overwhelming sort of feelings can lead you to making decisions that are, are you know, might not be good for your interests, you know, um, and so I always encourage people like stay involved with the organization who whatever I don't you know I've I've worked at many different organizations I I don't really have um you know a, a favorite dog in the race or whatever I want to see all of these organizations do well and so um I always say you know just find find uh organization and, and champion their cause and meet up with those individuals and um help the next cohort through and um and, and find ways to to stay integrated in that community because th those are the folks that are really going to help you when times get tough because nobody else can really as, as much as we as much as somebody might love you as much as somebody um wants to support you if they haven't been through what you've been through um it's it, they just can't understand right you know um as much as even they want to understand i mean uh it's just it's just not the same and so it's just important to maintain those connections and to get involved i think that it's good for just your own self uh you know to to feel like you're giving back in a meaningful way um and so yeah i encourage folks to to stay involved and I love that because as much as people love you, as much as everyone it means well for you, if they haven't been there, they will never understand what your personality, why your personality is like this, why you're like this, why you've been through. So being involved in an organization that will support that process, you know, pairing that matching process is so important. And I love that you said that. You know, now that you're free, what does it mean to you to be free? Especially now, I know before we started talking, you told me about your, you know, your gorgeous young man. How did you get yourself into integrated again to society and now you have a beautiful boy 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it's just been, you know, a lot of it has been sort of uh, being in the right places at the right time, uh, being willing to accept when you're wrong and make adjustments um, and to maintain sort of that, that um, you know, that, that mindset that you can recreate yourself. Um, and so I think that that's really important. I think that, you know, being present in the moment, not being too fixated on the past and, and imagining a new future is always key to this whole process. Um, I, what I've done, uh, freedom means everything to me. You know, like I said, I, I really was, I've always been a soul that sought freedom. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, that, that seeking of freedom was me running away from home or doing things that weren't, but, um, but ultimately I've, I've found one of the things that I learned while I was incarcerated, it was a quote from Rollo May, which is, uh, freedom is man's capacity to take a hand in his own development. And that really helped me through my time because I realized that even though my body was physically incarcerated, I could do, I could create myself and develop myself into being whatever I wanted. And that was so empowering because that was something they couldn't take from me. That was my freedom. And the same goes for out here, you know, um, uh, you know, as long as I'm able to develop and to, to change and make myself into uh, whatever it is that, that I desire to become, um, I'm free. And so that, that is, is very important. Um, I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of that is really, um, you know, making sure that you are in a good environment to do that. Um, and you're surrounded by folks that, that are encouraging that growth. I think that that's, that is integral. I've, um, I've been able to do things that I really never thought I would. I, I, I always had the hope that I would get out and be able to make an impact uh, in the community and to be a benefit to my community and to help change lives. Um, and uh, I've oftentimes kind of been beside myself with, uh, you know, some of the things I've been able to do and, um, you know, sort of the, some of the achievements that I've been able to make, you know, I'm currently, uh, uh, I'm currently uh, employed in the uh, Washington State Department of Commerce. And uh, that was a barrier. That was a hard barrier for a lot of years. Um, folks would pretty much say, you know, if you work for an organization that even contracts with the government, they won't hire felons, you know, um, that was really a, a big barrier. And in recent years, there's been some people that have broken through those barriers. And for me to have a position at the Department of Commerce, not only um, just any position, but also I'm, I'm overseeing the grants that are allocated to uh, um, uh, several reentry organizations throughout the state. And so um, to be able to, uh, you know, be sort of instrumental in, um, you know, helping those organizations manage the funds that they've been awarded and to, um, to be, you know, able to sort of guide that whole process here on the state level for me has just been a, one of those, another one of those moments where you're just, I'm just in awe with uh, where I've ended up and what I, and the impact that I'm able to make uh, given all of my experience, um, both lived experience with incarceration and, and um, being a troubled youth and all of those things to uh, my prison education and then post-prison education. And then now uh, my professional career uh, it's just really been um, amazing and something that I'm extraordinarily grateful for. I'm really happy for you, Kurt. This is unbelievable. If I let you go, I've got two, one, one, um, two questions. One is that you hold a degree from university from the Washington University of Tacoma. How has this, this degree helped you when you go out and to present yourself to people? Has that helped you in any way? And would you have encouraged others to do the same, to go if, 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 if by any chance you had to be, you know, something bad, you were in prison, would you encourage others to actually utilize getting a degree? Did that help you? Yeah, it helped me. Look, so one of the um, sort of happy accidents uh, while I was uh, going through school, I had, um, I started school about six months after I got out. 
um, I started attending business school. And mind you, I, I, I knew that I wasn't the only formerly incarcerated student out there doing work um, and trying to, you know, get a degree and all of that. But um, it, it happens to be the case that it's most often folks that are, um, you know, directly impacted by incarceration oftentimes go into like social uh you know, services, criminology, uh, you know, to, with the uh, hopes that they might be able to be, you know, like a social worker or, um, you know, be able to make an impact with the, in sort of direct, direct service work. Um, and um, for me, I've always had this like entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I wanted to learn sort of the functions of organizations, organizational leadership and all of that, because um, it was something that I knew that would be necessary for my community as a whole, for formerly incarcerated people as a whole, to understand how these nonprofits are formed, all these different roles, how to maximize and optimize functions at these organizations, all of that. And so while I was going through business school, um, my lived experience wasn't something that I would readily shared with my, you know, fellow students in the business school, um, as opposed to like, you know, other, other folks who were like, might be taking criminology courses that probably raise their hand every five minutes to, you know, correct the record or to, you know, share some information regarding their experience and being a major benefit to their, to their, uh, student groups or their, um, or their classroom as they unpack sort of these concepts. Um, but for me, it was kind of just like, you know, in business school, it's like, you don't want to reveal any kind of stain that you have or whatever on your, because that might affect your chances of, you know, getting that job at that, that, uh, financial institution or that, you know, that accounting firm or whatever. Right. And so yeah. it's a whole different ethos there. Um, and so I was kind of under the radar the whole time, you know, uh, actually there was a couple, there was a couple of teachers that I had where I, uh, I felt comfortable like in an, in an essay that I wrote or something explaining to them sort of my path. And then, you know, I'd turn it in and I'd come in the next day and they'd look at me, uh, like Kurt, glad to have you in my class you know like under wraps but they know yeah. they know that you know and so it was really um it was really awesome uh and I think that for me I was able to start using these things right away so I was able to um there had been a formerly incarcerated uh professor there at UWT who started building community there um he started a uh, post-prison education research lab um, and he asked me to be his pro project coordinator while I was still in school. And so now I'm able to use some of these business, uh, many of these business concepts uh, in, in a role where I'm actually helping to make a make a difference and, and help create pathways from prison to 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 um, university. Right. And so. Okay. And it's something that I had lived, you know, personally and something that, you know, meant a lot to me. And so now I'm able to use these business skills uh, in service of the things that really matter most to me. Um, and then all the while we sort of started finding out there's, you know, we're, we're, part of our task is to find out how many formerly incarcerated people are really here at UWT because everybody's under the radar for, you know, most of them. Right. And so we're trying to find and, we, you know, come to find out we there's so many there were so many and we built community there. Um, and to this day, we're all still um, very much friends working together, uh, collaborating on different things. Um, many of us have, um, you know, found our career paths and are working at different organizations. And we have all these connections with one another and are working to mutually support one another. So it's really been um, amazing. And my business my business uh, sort of experience has really helped me in uh, achieving all of those things. Yeah. I'm going to go to the last question. Finally, you, you've described people as dynamic beings who hope to become better versions of ourselves and leave behind a better world. How do you plan to make this world a better world? In a simple answer, how do you plan on doing this? Yeah, um, I, I said that. <laughs> I said yeah. that quote. Yes. Okay, yeah. Oh, it looks like I have a I have a visitor here. Um, so I think that for me, um, <laughs> hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hello. How are you? Um, 
I'm good. <laughs> uh, I think that for me, you know, um, the way that I plan on doing that, and I've always said that, you know, I, I, pro I probably won't live to see the change that I would like to see in my lifetime. But if I can do anything to sort of further, you know, get the ball down the field uh, as far as I can while I'm here, then that's what I plan to do. Right. And so um, I will always be, you know, working um, just to, uh, you know, make it so that there's better systems in place for folks to overcome the traumas that they are um, suffering from, to heal, to grow, to learn and to ultimately overcome all of these social ills that we deal with, you know, I mean, car incarceration is one of them, but that's really just a, a you know, wrongly sort of applied um, <laughs> uh, prescription to the problems that we face. You know, we have, uh, um, we have, you goof or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have, you know, drug addiction, homelessness, yeah. um, mental health, all of these things, right, that sort of fold into why folks end up in, in incarcerated. And um, so if we can work to address those problems and uh, create other opportunities for folks, um, <laughs> if I can do anything to help those causes, then that's what I plan to do. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. And young man, thank you for joining us. This is amazing. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Good. Uh, thank you for having me. And um, I, I look forward to um, yeah seeing this uh, posted and, and learning more about all the other amazing folks that you interview. This is really great. Thank you.